How do cells make ATP? Okay, so ways to generate ATP. So let's set the stage. Uh, here I have a muscle cell. And like all cells, it needs to have a supply of nourishment coming to it and a way to get rid of waste. So I have a capillary next to the cell. And in that capillary are going to be carried nutrients for ATP production. So let's look at the fastest way that your cells can make uh, ATP. This is called um, direct phosphorylation, and it is the rarest kind of, um, or not the rarest, sorry, but it, it's the shortest lasting way to generate ATP. Okay, so this would be um, no oxygen needed. Only lasts maybe 10 seconds. So if you were gonna lift a weight, you could use this method to generate ATP. The ingredient would be creatine phosphate. And maybe that right away rings a bell to you. Maybe you've heard of um, weightlifters taking creatinine supplements. And what they're hoping is that the creatinine will be delivered to their muscle cells via their bloodstream, right? But what do they have to hope is that, first of all, did it even get absorbed from their GI tract into their bloodstream, or did they just poop it out? And then after that, once it gets absorbed, does it get carried to the right cells? Can it actually enter the cell? And then the other thing they have to wonder about with those supplements is, are the proper modifications made to the raw material that they're ingesting so that it ends up as the appropriate creatine phosphate? Well, if all of that happens, then they're able to combine creatine phosphate with ADP. And when the creatine phosphate bumps into the ADP with the help of other enzymes, it will give this phosphate over here, and then you yield um, ATP plus creatinine. Oops, creatinine, sorry. Creatinine, and then that creatinine is a waste product that is carried away by the blood. So creatine is the supplement, creatinine is the waste product of this type of um, ATP production. And I have a couple other things to mention about this. Um, creatinine is toxic in your blood, and so it will go to the kidneys. So if someone is taking an antibiotic, for example, an aminoglycoside antibiotic, or if someone is um, concerned, if, if the doctors are concerned about uh, kidney problems with a particular medication or a complication of a disease, then they will check serum creatinine. So nurses monitor the lab levels of serum creatinine in some patients and that's what they're looking for is this waste product are the kidneys excreting it like they should and then where did this come from it comes from the generation of ATP by direct phosphorylation where a creat creat creatine phosphate bumps into ADP and then you end up with an ATP this only lasts for about 10 seconds so this is a pow power moves quick moves and if you were going to try and get in shape in like weightlifting, then you would stimulate um, 
repeated power workouts will stimulate your muscle cells to store more creatine phosphate. Pretty cool, huh? So you can adapt to the workouts and become a better power lifter. Now, ADP, you always have tons of that around. It's um, not something that you need to store more of. But certainly, ATP, it's, see, ATP is unstable, and it really quickly will then go back to ADP. So you've always got lots of ADP. It's the ATP you need to get more of. And remember, without the ATP, the myosin head cannot fall back off of the actin and you won't be able to continue the cross bridge cycle to continue a muscle contraction. Okay, so that is method number one, um, and we'll call that direct phosphorylation, and it is considered anaerobic. That's when I said no oxygen needed, but it doesn't last very long. It only gives you about 10 seconds worth of ATP and then you'll have exhausted all of the creatine phosphate that you were able to store. Okay, now the second method uh, also just occurs in the cytoplasm, not in these mitochondria. The second one is called glycolysis. And let's use a different color, how about blue? Okay, so glycolysis, and you're probably um, fairly familiar with this from general biology, but this one also, no, uh, so it's anaerobic, no oxygen needed, and what happens is a molecule of glucose is broken into two pieces of pyruvate, so you get two pyruvate, and in the breaking of that, you get ATP. So this isn't a direct phosphorylation, it's um, a, a breaking of glucose and then energy is released. I have another idea, let's um, put ATP in orange in all of the pictures so you can see because this is the purpose, right? This is why we're doing it. And then where did that glucose come from? It comes from the bloodstream, right? So when you eat a meal then the glucose in that food passes through your liver and um, then your liver will monitor how much of it gets released into your bloodstream and then um, under the influence of insulin it will be allowed in I could put that in here. insulin needed to allow glucose entry and that's why if someone has diabetes um, they either don't have enough insulin or the insulin that they do have is not effective at allowing glucose to enter the cells. In that case, we call them insulin resistant. So pyruvate then is um, converted into lactic acid. And lactic acid, you hear, hear in the name acid, is a waste product that lowers the pH of your cells and so it is sent out into the bloodstream to be carried away. And again, your kidneys are going to help get rid of excess lactic acid, but your blood needs to maintain its pH and so you're going to also have to breathe harder to get rid of um, uh, extra carbon dioxide in your blood that makes your pH of your blood go down too. But so to kind of to recap, you need creatin creatine, sorry, creatine delivered to your cells for direct phosphorylation. You need glucose delivered to your cells for glycolysis. Notice that that's the only ingredient. And then the lactic acid is a waste product of glycolysis and um, creatinine is a waste product of direct phosphorylation. So this kind of workout um, or ATP production will last you for about 45 seconds. meaning you can store up enough of the enzymes needed 
uh, there's about 11 different chemical reactions to make this happen and all of the different enzymes necessary, you can store up uh, about enough of them to do this for about 45 seconds. You can also store glycogen in your cells, in your muscle cells, and then that can be broken down into glucose. So someone that is uh, like a soccer player or basketball player and does a lot of glycolysis to get their ATP, they're going to get very good at storing glycogen in their muscle cells so they have it ready to break down into glucose. And they're going to have a lot of the enzymes necessary to break glucose down into pyruvate. Furthermore, they're probably going to be very sensitive to insulin and allow glucose readily into the cell during the workout so they can um, continue uh, so they can do 45 seconds and they would need a break for a little bit to re regenerate some of the enzymes and then they can continue on. So you could do sprint and then jog and then sprint and then jog. Okay, now um, the last way I'm going to show you about making ATP, we'll use um, maybe purple for this one and I'll write about it down here. And this one is called oxidative phosphorylation. And it relies on the electron transport system. Within the mitochondria. So you can't do this one without mitochondria. It also requires oxygen. So in this case, what happens is that uh, fatty acids and pyruvate and amino acids, so all of the different nutrients that you eat, can um, have their, let's see, kind of make an arrow like this, their electrons collected in the cytoplasm. by electron carriers, and this is where you've heard of things like NADH and FADH2. And then those electrons are carried in the E, the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. And that stimulates ATP synthase, makes loads of ATP. So this is a lot more productive way to make ATP than the other two methods. The thing is, is that you have to have enough oxygen to make it happen. So it's the most efficient, but it is um, always requires oxygen, and that's why our body has those first two that don't require oxygen that are um, our backup methods. So ATP synthase makes loads of ATP, and the magnet that pulls all of that is oxygen, is necessary. So um, oxidative phosphorylation requires oxygen. It takes place in the mitochondria. It can use the electrons from any of these nutrients to be passed along the membrane in the mitochondria and make loads of ATP. Now when the electrons are collected, a waste product is produced, carbon dioxide. So um, I guess we can just use purple again so you get this waste product of carbon dioxide and this is why we breathe out carbon dioxide. I'm putting this up to the blood so carbon dioxide is another waste. You see how I put it up? 
put that up there. We could continue this. Actually, I'm going to use a thicker Sharpie. Carry that out like that. And then highlight it in pink. Okay. And then an ingredient we need in order for this one to work is oxygen. So you have oxygen in the blood. Let's try to write it over here. And then that is an ingredient needed to collect some of the extra electrons at the end of the chain. So I put oxygen up here, and then I drew a line down, 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 and over. So if someone is very fit, then they are very good, and, and let's say a long distance runner, they're very good at using fatty acids and pyruvate and amino acids to um, generate electrons that can be carried in the mitochondria. So someone that runs a lot of marathons will have more mitochondria in their muscle cells than someone that doesn't. They'll also have more of the enzymes necessary to complete the Krebs cycle, which is, um, that's what, when I, I'm, or the citric acid cycle, whichever you've heard it called. Okay, so you can see that in order to make ATP, your cells need oxygen, they need creatine, and they need uh, glucose. And then they need a good blood supply to carry away lactic acid, creatinine, and carbon dioxide as waste products.